Scott, we're so excited to have you with us. Uh, the title of this session is Advancing Nonviolent Civilian Based Defense and Religious Peacebuilding uh, The Case of War in Ukraine. So, my name is Eli McCarthy. I'm a professor at Georgetown University in Justice and Peace Studies. I had a chance to take a couple trips to Ukraine last year. One was an interfaith delegation, a second one was meeting with about 25 local peace builders and nonviolent resistors in Ukraine in the in the city of Kiev. And we heard a lot of amazing stories of uh, people doing non cooperation in really difficult situations, farmers refusing to sell grain to Russian soldiers, school directors refusing to teach Russian curriculum and civilians hiding them so they would be protected. But the the practitioners in Ukraine also asked that their stories were shared more broadly. They asked for help with training, like how to run a strategic campaign, digital security. They also asked for help with their advocating their government to generate a strategy of non cooperation that they could all participate in in the occupied areas. So last point here, and then I'm going to pass it over to our moderator and our speakers. I, I talked with a friend who went to Ukraine a couple weeks ago into the Zaporista region, which is where the nuclear plant is. And they were talking with many civilians about how to establish a safety zone and different things like that. And they were told a particular story that before the Russians controlled Zaporista, they were, the military was trying to get into that region and the civilians for six straight days gathered on the streets and blocked the access to the Russian military. And the Russians were not, did not get in. Finally, on the seventh day, they blocked them again. And then when they left in the evening, the Russians came in at night, they killed some Ukrainian National Guardsmen, and then they had control of Zaporista. So six straight days, they were able to hold them off through this kind of spontaneous civilian-based defense. So we're going to learn a lot more about this. Marie Dennis is going to be our moderator today. She is the senior director of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative with Pax Christi International and a very inspiring, amazing person. Um, so let me hand it over to you, and we'll get rolling. Thank you, Eli, and welcome again, everyone. <clears throat> this session will engage the question of how to develop nonviolent civilian based defense for large scale conflicts, with the example of Ukraine providing a critical illustration of the need for such development. After learning of proven examples and understanding their dynamics, the session will challenge participants to imagine and create a sequence of critical steps to develop a systemic nonviolent civilian based defense for your own context. In a related effort to break cycles of violence, this session will also explore the intersection of religion and peace building in Ukraine, as well as ways to support such activity. In turn, this session will contribute to solutions that we hope can prevent war, minimize harm if war occurs, and generate a more sustainable peace. This is a session that is um, both by Zoom, as you can see, and in person. So we uh, have the pleasure of welcoming to our circle um, three uh, speakers who will lead our conversation today, beginning with Philippe Daza, who is a professor of civil resistance, public advocacy, and human rights in the Paris School of International Affairs of the Sciences Poe University and Open University of Catalonia. For the past 20 years, he has engaged with nonviolent movements from the Middle East and North Africa, Eastern Europe, and the South Caucasus. He has recently published the civil resistance, uh, the, an account of the civil resistance experience in Ukraine in the Ukrainian nonviolent civil resistance in the face of war. He is also a senior consultant for United Nations, the United Nations Interregional Crime and Justice 
Research Institute. So welcome, Philippe. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you. Uh, I cannot see your, your faces. I hope uh, um, that the, the, the audience here um, will allow me to, to express their gratitude to participate in this important conference. And yeah, so um, as uh, Denise was mentioned that the, the, the report, I will share with you my, my screen so everybody can see the, one second. Yeah, no, much better. So, yeah, as it was mentioned already, I, I conducted a, a, from the, the beginning of the, the last scale invasion, I conducted a, a report, a, a research called Ukrainian Non-Binary Civil Resistance in the Face of War, that the, from the period of 2000, uh, sorry, uh, February 24 until uh, June 30, but I continue conducting uh, consultations and, and different meetings with uh, activists uh, at the end of uh, 2022 and also the beginning of, uh, of this year. So um, we combined uh, uh, mapping uh, around 2035 non-binary actions. So um, Ellie was already highlighting some specific actions, but only this uh, 235 is just the, the peak of the iceberg. So, there are hundreds of actions that they were not recorded in Telegram or dis disseminated in the in the national local media. Uh, but there are the you know day by day you know we are recovering these stories, and I think that it's very important to recover these stories in order to talk about the memory and also talk about the recognition of the people that they were behind this type of you know anonymous heroes that they were confronting the the, the, the invasion and they were supporting the people and saving lives. Um, so from the majority of the, the, the comments I will share with you and the, and the findings are basically systematized in this report. Um, but I would like to start, you know, making general trends of the non-binary action from the period of uh, February until June 2022. Uh, at the beginning of the, of the invasion, we saw like a, a, a predominant uh, um, uh, massive actions like public actions expressions actions in the in the country like we had uh, different uh, uh, demonstrations in Kherson, for example there were daily uh, actions uh, against the occupier we also saw like different uh, uh, musical activities uh, using the, the ukrainian folklore so all these specific you know acts of expression had a very important you know um, aim of you know show and maintaining the high morale and having a very clear message that the that this territory was ukraine and the people were ukrainian people and this is very important because this is also quite connected with the idea of um, basically consolidating and reinforcing the ukrainian identity something that i will speak later on so it's also true that the um, from until the end of March, these actions were very, uh, very frequent, especially in the occupied areas. But when the, um, the basically the repression start to increase, especially in Kherson, Saporizhia, so these specific actions start to, to decrease. And then we start to show a second wave of actions, more connected with clandestine actions in, in the ground. People start to basically hang in uh, uh, yellow, blue ribbons at night, Making graffitis in the cities, showing that the Kherson was uh, was was uh, Ukraine, Ukraine uh, hanging flags, or withdrawing even Soviet and Russian flags from public blue, uh, buildings. So it was also uh, very important actions, but they were clandestine in order to avoid the risk uh, of the arbitrary detention. It's very important to understand, uh, to highlight that these actions um, were had a very important, uh, of course, uh, you know. Um, goal to maintain again the, the high morale of the people, and we need to understand that the um, the Russians were not expecting the, the specific uh, re resistance in this area. They were especially, for example, in the areas of Kherson, that they were traditional more exposed to the Russian uh, influence. They were it was expected more um, uh, it was expected more uh, support, you know, even to to embrace the, the invasion, no. And, and this specific you know, resistance was something, something that affected and demoralized the, 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 Russian, the Russian soldiers. 
In, at the end of April until June, we start to see uh, a new wave of applicants uh, more connected with non-cooperation. Ellie was mentioned some of them, but I think these, these non-cooperation actions were critical. We saw non-cooperation actions from the health sector, for, uh, or for example, from the uh, from different uh, workers in, in malls or public workers that refused to to go to build barricades, you know, uh, for the for the Russian Russian soldiers, and especially the actions from the uh, from the local authorities, like uh, local authorities refused, for example, to deliver the public censors to the uh, to the Russians in order to conduct the, the pseudo referendums. This had a very important uh, also impact in terms of undermining the military goals of the, of the occupier. In, after this period, after June, we, we see um, in the, the, the last picture of the situation, we saw a very important decrease of actions. I think that the areas of uh, Saporizia, the situation is, is very, very risky. Areas like Donetsk, Luhansk, you know, the front line, it's very difficult to see like specific non-violent actions, uh, but still, for example, in, in Crimea, there, are, there is a very strong cultural resistance movement that are Crimeans are organizing different different type of actions connected with the, uh, with the, with culture, with music, showing their their identity and connecting their identity with the Ukrainian symbology and the Ukrainian you know flags and and and, and uh, basically a nation. And, and this is something that is still ongoing, again, uh, in combination with the Yellow River campaign in some of the occupied areas as well. I would like to, go, to move on now into more into the concrete impacts and some uh, challenges. So first of all, it's the, the specific uh, impacts on undermining the military goals. I will say that the, the, at the beginning of, of the invasion, the uh, specific, uh, specific actions regarding physical interposition of uh, to the military convoys, convoys for, um, uh, for example, like a, um, a construction of barricades in some cities. Uh, it really um, um, slowed down the movements of the Russian troops' direction to uh, uh, to Kiev. This has a, has a specific impact. But at the same time, uh, in areas occupied areas like Kherson and Saporizhia, when these areas were already occupied. The, the Russians had also uh, two, two fronts. One was to, to combat the Ukrainian army in the front line, and the second one also was to control the urban areas, because there were, again, daily demonstrations by the, by the local residents uh, against the, the invasion. Um, all the specific um, impacts is also very important. I think that nonviolence, one of the most uh, important capacities is the is basically the capacity to provide to to provide answers in the in in armed conflicts, and one of these needs is security, is the protection of civilians. So um, we we observe, you know, how the uh, um, the civil society has led the uh, a solid uh, security system of protection. Um, for example, from the evacuation um, of uh, local residents in the occupied areas and the transportation to uh, safe places, also the um, uh, provision of psychosocial support in, some, in, the, in, this, in the West areas. So all this specific, you know, uh, let's say protection system was organized by civil society, by non-binary activists, and especially by, by women. So women had a very important role in, um, in the evacuation uh, phases and the transportation of uh, um, uh, local residents, citizens, to the safe places. Another important uh, element that we observed was the capacity to establish dialogue with Russian army. Again, in the occupied areas, they, we recorded, we registered um, cases where um, the, um, civilians, uh, local residents, were able to enter into dialogue and negotiation with the Russian soldiers to release uh, uh, citizens that they were you know, under detention. This, this has, uh, we have several cases of uh, this situation. Um, and also we had uh, cases where there were um, situations of even fraternization with the Russian soldiers. One of the concrete examples was the case of Slavutich, which is the, the, call the, the, the town of the workers of Chernobyl, which is a, a city located in the north of, uh, of, of Ukraine. And when the, the city was occupied on uh, March 26th, the whole uh, um, um, the whole uh, city go out to the streets, organize in the in the in the public hall in the in the main square, 
and then they move direction to the occupiers. The occupiers were, you know, they were completely stupefied by the situation, but there was a, a, a very, you know, constant, you know, movement of the of the um, of the local residents towards them, with music, with flags, with uh, with smiles. And there was a moment there was a confrontation, direct confrontation, face to face between Russians and the um, and the uh, uh, and the local citizens. And in this moment, there was the these forces, the non-violence force, and then in the other side, this military force. There were a there were a space, you know, for fraternization and for forcing a negotiation. This negotiation was the release of the mayor who was captured uh, some uh, some hours before, and also the withdrawal of the Russian army uh, two days later. Um, another important element is that the non-violence also affecting the pillars of power of, of the Kremlin. We can observe that uh, it's not only affecting the military goals, you know, in Ukraine, but also affecting the uh, domestic uh, politics inside the, inside the, uh, in Russia. For example, we can, if we observe the, uh, the evolution of the Russian propaganda, how, you know, uh, Putin, you know, and the different ministers were changing and changing the narrative and the justification of the special operation uh, is, is also connected with the evolution on the ground, not only with the military def defeats, but also, you know, with the incapacity to, to demonstrate uh, or to justify the liberation of the Ukrainians. When you have people every day demonstrating in the streets, in the squares of the cities, saying that this is Ukraine, so you don't have too many evidence, you know, to show to the people that you are sa saving lives, no? Um, this is also connected and is connected with one another research I'm, I'm now uh, conducting, but uh, why, you know, for example, Russia is now increasing the use of uh, private armies like Wagner Group. So this is also connected with the incapacity and the difficulties to have more military mobilizations in, in Russia. We have already one million people that has left the country and uh, many people don't understand in Russia why, what, the, what is the, this reason of this war, right? So another uh, area of, uh, of, of impact, I will say, is the, the community resilience, and this is very important. So uh, contemporary conflicts, in the contemporary conflicts, uh, um, motivation is very important. And um, we can see the difference between the, what is happening inside Russia and what is happening in Ukraine. In Ukraine, it's very clear that people is fighting for the territory, for the people, and for their identity. They, they consider this, this, um, uh, this war as a um, a battle of self-determination and social emancipation process, and and they are really really convinced that they need to they need to win, and this is creating um, a very strong solidarity, a very strong resilience between the people. But of course, this is not enough. You need to create also a, a strong communication systems, you know, to to convey this solidarity. I have a, I have recorded stories from activists from Sumi region in the north of the country as well. You know, every day, you know, making stories about the the stories about supporting people, uh, about resisting, and, and these communication systems are really, really important to maintain resilience. And this, again, this is connected with the idea of these clandestine actions, you know, to like the Yellow Ribbon campaign, maintain the high morale, even in, in context of, uh, of occupation. So um, another, um, I think is, this is connected again, and maybe my colleagues will, will develop later on better the concept of the, the Ukrainian identity, but again, in this process of self-determination, so uh, the consolidation of Ukrainian identity is very, very important. I think Ukrainian identity is one of the one of the key topics now um, that they are being discussed in the liberated areas. Uh, so, what means uh, to be Ukrainian, and what means uh, you know what is going to be to be Ukrainian in the in the modern Ukrainian uh, uh, nation. Um, one final, uh, one key uh, component uh, that I wanted to highlight as well is the. The, the local governance. I think that the uh, non-violence is also uh, uh, intimately connected with the idea of community organizing. So all the community organizing uh, around non-violent actions are, are really important. And we observe, you know, the uh, emergence of self-organized groups, groups composed by ordinary citizens, people that they, they never had, they never engaged in social activism, with people that they, they have, there are professionals, people from you know, uh, you know, professional NGOs that they move to the rural areas to support the the, the families, so to, to support the the uh, people at local level. So this composition, these self-organized groups, 
it are authentic schools of uh, you know social and political empowerment so we have now uh, multiple uh, leaders at the, at the community level there are people that there are uh, they have uh, recognition credibility legitimacy by the whole community because they were doing a very important work in the most difficult times and the siege you know, by, by the Russians and the occupation. So these people can be uh, the future leaders at regional level or even at national level. It's very important to continue supporting this, this process. But again, the, the, this power, this people's power that, that is, is evolving at a local level is very important um, for the future, for the, 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 for the democracy in, in Ukraine. A, democracy, a democratic process that started, uh, you know, uh, decades ago, in, as you know, in the 2014, after uh, Romadan, the, um, there was a, a very important package of reforms. One of them was the decentralization process, you know, to bring more power to the uh, to at local level. And if the, the local communities are more ready, more, more, and have more capacities, and of course, more experience and practice, you know, on dealing with the uh, uh, local issues that are going to, we are going to have a more healthy, uh, uh, the democracy and the final company is the, the accountability process so and, uh, in in the face of um, of armed conflicts so people need security people need the recovery but also people need to confront impunity and uh, in we consider all the dramatic consequences of, of this war and all the the human tragedies the accountability company is very important and here the human rights organizations the, the coalition for example 5 a.m or um, uh, important organizations like civil, uh, civil, uh, civil liberties organization um, has created a very sophisticated and, and professional um, infrastructure for monitoring and, and uh, monitoring war crimes and in, increase to, in order to increase the accountability um, to the uh, basically to the aggressors. So I will, this is the, the, the part of the impacts and I will finalize with some ideas just for, for, the, for the debate. So if we are thinking about um, developing um, non-violent civilian-based defense system for uh, uh, armed conflicts or large-scale conflicts, I think it's very important to, to that the, 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 the starting point of the civil society. Civil society is, the, is essential and, and to have a very strong civil society with a very diverse ecosystem of organizations, like uh, human, rights, human rights organizations, for example, communities of mediation and dialogue, uh, peace building organizations, um, uh, independent journalism. So this is very important in order to, to have uh, the base you know, of, of this system. And, and, other, and also connected with this key element is the idea of where the power is. The power in Ukraine was at local level. So everything happened at local level, even though that we have some um, networks and some systems that they were uh, national, uh, uh, national uh, they had a national perspective, like for example, the, the, the monitoring world crimes, the majority of the mobile actions were decentralized and were occurring at a local level without a hierarchical system. And I think that this is also um, a very, is a, is a, um, another value when, when it comes about large conflicts because uh, it can confront centralized armies. So this decentralization is also another value to confront, you know, like uh, this type of uh, 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 modern armies. And uh, Philippe, yeah. Philippe, can you hear me? Just about one more minute, okay? And then we have to move on to the next speakers. Perfect. And then at local level, we, we need to also to, pay, to put attention on the, uh, the centers of local power. So in Ukraine, the, lo the local power was cultural centers, youth centers. Uh, the, the small charts in, in, uh, in Melitopol. So these are also places where all the local life and the, and the people is organized and articulated. Again, community and resilience and the concept of motivation is really important. I will keep it here. And then the concept of hybrid formats, self-organized groups, to try to reinforce uh, and to create spaces of uh, coordination between professional organizations, uh, grassroots organizations, and ordinary citizens. And, and finally, the, the role of women, uh, I think it's very, very important also to, to ensure very, uh, very important uh, or to, to provide answer to very important uh, needs in, in the context of our conflicts. And we'll keep it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, your research is making a tremendous contribution to this conversation. Thank you. 
Our next speaker will be Tatiana <clears throat> Kalenyachenko, who has a PhD in sociology, the sociology of religion. Her thesis was on the religious component in socio-political context conflict in Ukraine between 2013 and 2017. With her colleagues, Tatiana created an initiative called Dialogue in Action that aims to develop a culture of dialogue in territorial communities in Ukraine, uniting secular and religious leaders. Welcome, Tatiana. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for an honor to present and uh, good afternoon, good evening for those who are listening and for you. Uh, I will talk briefly and I will hope to keep the timeline about religion at war and a special phase based peace building practices in Ukraine. And I will talk from various perspectives of uh, academia person and practitioner. As soon as I think in that phase based peace building is a special part of peace building practices now and especially after the full scale invasion in 2022. So just in general, just to remind for those people who are not so in such an Ukrainian religious context, here you can see some ordinary photo of um, all Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations representatives who are uniting 95% of all religious organizations in Ukraine. Uh, there are several Christian denominations, Muslim denominations, Jewish, a non-Christian and others, and there's a special platform uh, since 2004 where they're trying to get consensus decision and to get a mutual position of religious organizations of Ukraine. Anyways, it's not the only one form, and I will talk briefly about different forms of activities. But as for me, it's one of the official organizations which could be like an image of multi-religious context and landscape of Ukraine. And definitely it's not only Christian, it's not only about orthodoxy, but it's about celebrating diversity in all measures of religious, national, civil identity, and also attempts to rethink peace building because in 2017, they created a special strategy on building peace in Ukraine. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to do it so, uh, but anyway, in general, religious leaders and active believers are ready to do something. Still, they need to understand what do we mean by peace. Definitely, we've got the rapid changes after 2014 and especially after the last year. And on the photo, you can see one of the typical ruins because we've got hundreds of ruins of religious objects in Ukraine now. And it's a special moment of what I would say of physical existential ruin for people. And definitely, I will just talk briefly about overall general trends for religious organizations at war without specifics. So definitely there is a need for public positioning and response to all range of crises. So we've got social economical, political crisis, COVID, which didn't help a lot for religious organizations, uh, full scale invasion as the recent one. And also it's a need to adapt all the time. That's the reason why we are so much focus now on the frames of adaptive peace building because it's possible to understand how you can be flexible in responses to ongoing crises. There is still a trend of politicization and instrumentalization of religion, uh, not only by politicians, but also for businessmen, for other forces, because it's not only about religious conflicts, uh, which we're dealing with, but it's more about resource based conflicts which involves religious component or religious organizations into it. There are several conflicts among different denominations, and mainly I've got an example of Protestant communities in Ukraine and Russia and Orthodox communities, because they've got a coverage for not only Ukraine, but Russia, and they've got a strong ties between each other. And it's really important just to see the dynamics of relationship between people and uh, a an special focus with this uh, part of religious organizations. Definitely, all religious organizations should deal with internal dilemmas, like, for example, how to deal with occupation and how to stay on non-government controlled areas if it's possible, 
and uh, what should be direction and some instructions for those leaders on the ground. Uh, how to deal with difficult, uh, different political views by people and by laity who are attending services and attending prayers. How to deal with different leaders and to position themselves in terms of war and in terms of different uh, social dilemmas they've got. There is a huge need of revision of theological explanations and reflections, not only on the Ukrainian level, but on global religious level too. And we've got a special development it's called like theology of peace and theology of war in trying to understand how religious leaders should act, how it's possible to explain on existential level for believers, and uh, how it's possible to do something in future and what should be the basis on. And of course, it's needed to form international global communication because even uh, Orthodox, if, uh, if we take into account Orthodox dilemma in Ukraine today, that's not only about Ukraine, that's about global orthodoxy in the world. We've got a lot of public practices of peace building, and by peace building, I mean a wide range of activities, in, in not only in social cohesion, but in general on nonviolent resistance, on dealing with humanitarian crisis, and a lot of which Philip already mentioned. And this quite symbolical photo uh, on one of the shelters during the bombing, an air alarm, when you can see a monk, uh, a nun, sorry, uh, preaching to people who are there. Probably not all of them are Christians, but at least they're trying to take this role of uh, psychosocial support and the role of uh, some stability in life and existential presence, even for those who are not believers at all. We've got several public practices like public prayers for peace, and we've got a lot of religious representatives gathering in the main sense of the cathedral. Doesn't matter are they Christian or not, but it's like a symbolical place of a cathedral of ninth century. But they gather together with president mainly and prime minister and praying for peace for Ukraine. Also, there's a presence on social political level and different political processes and trying to understand how the processes should be and especially in terms of war because active phase of war is not a time when we stop any kind of peace building activities there is a huge need and still ongoing process of commemoration of war victims still it's needed to be understood who do we mean by war victims and how we should make the frame of it and in general how we should commemorate not to forget anyone, but also to get uh, this as a platform not only for sadness, but for future. Of course, it's a, a all Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations events and on a global level and special on a platform of OAC. But I would say that a special role is now dedicated for military chaplains, those who are standing with not only militaries, but with all people on the front line together uh, dealing with the same dilemmas and the same troubles every day. And they are those people who are standing on the front line and trying to respond to all the crises they've got and critical questions too. And of course, it's a whole range of social ministry. And uh, one of it you can see in a train that's like a, a moral support for kids who are evacuated from the war zone. And there are all the types of social services we've got, especially in um, humanitarian crisis and humanitarian interventions, on in cooperation sometimes with secular activities, but sometimes when it's impossible for international foundations or secular initiatives to come in and to uh, serve and to get any kind of services for people, then the religious leaders who are staying in a gray zone, who are staying under occupation, they're the only one people who are getting this possibility to evacuate, even from Lugansk, Donetsk today, which are occupied for years, get some shelter. They've got a lot of monasteries and uh, camps for refugee hubs, exchange of prisoners, and also that was a special mission of Orthodox Church to Mariupol when they were trying to negotiate with the Russian side and to get people free. Uh, also, there's humanitarian aid in all spheres and abroad too. 
and shelters abroad are working a lot on religious and faith-based basis. And of course, it's legal and social support, especially for families who lost their relatives and who are engaged in military service. And that's actually what changed for the last year, because before it was not so typical to get someone who is serving on the front line in your family, but now it's almost impossible to find anyone who didn't get those relatives on the front line. And a special part of first spiritual and psychological help. And it's really important to divide those two types because it's not only psychological, it is needed, but a lot of responses on an existential level too. And here you can see on a photo one of the public inter-Orthodox dialogues. I would not say it's so resultive right now, but at least it's possible to unite and, and to get any kind of safe space for meeting each other and uh, for people from with really different perspectives inside one Christian confession, but different jurisdictions. And we've got a lot of types of faith based dialogues like official and unofficial representation on global level and when they're traveling abroad. And also that's about faith based diaspora of Ukrainian people in all countries. So it's uh, a lot of Latin horizontal and shuttle diplomacy meetings and I emphasize Protestant Orthodox because when it's impossible, for example, to find your relatives or your friends who lost connection and who were um, especially forcibly moved to some regions of Russia, it's possible sometimes to find and to save people and children through religious networks who keep that connections. Also, that negotiations aimed on humanitarian issues, sometimes water supplies or exchange of prisoners. It's a dialogue in the form of questions. It's a public uh, 10 questions from Ukrainian Orthodox uh, Church clergy and also uh, 10 theses from lady people to Orthodox Church of Ukraine as a, one of the examples. And there are a lot of secular and religious attempts to interact and to cooperate, and that's uh, the focus we've got in our dialogue connection initiative. But in general, I will use a symbolic photo of yogi people in the center of Kharkiv with this rocket. Because uh, it's a time and it's a lesson if we talk in general about faith based peace building in Ukraine today on the region and mission role and approach in peace building and understanding that peace building is possible during the active phase of war. It's needed, and it's needed, it's a huge need to understand what kind of peace do we want in future years, how it's possible to see it, to get this vision and to get it on a practical level. And of course, taking the role and the mission of religious communities, which is a part of civil society, and they shouldn't be excluded from international, from national and local processes, and they are really important in developing collective identity and responsibility, not on the level of religious communities, but on local communities in the forms of decentralization. And as you should pay a special attention for adaptive peace building, and it's possible to respond to deep crisis. And there are some uh, current photos from our dialogue connection initiative. One of it on the right side that's actually taken in a shelter, because no matter we've got alarm or not, as we've got it right now, we're still working on and we try to meet offline and to keep interreligious and religious secular groups because it's really important if we get this opportunity to get a space for dialogue, safe meeting with each other and discussing how we can understand each other and cooperate without enforcing our own views on another person. So maybe I will stop here and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Tatiana. <clears throat> the important role of, of religious peace building in Ukraine. Our third speaker is Christine Schweitzer. Christine has spent most of her professional life working in nonviolence and peace movements. She's from Germany. Currently, she is a researcher at the Institute for Peacework and Nonviolent Conflict Transformation, which uh, Christine co founded. She's the executive secretary of the German organization, the Federation for Social Defense, and co-editor of the bi-monthly magazine, Peace Forum. Welcome, Christine. Thank you for being with us. 
Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'll also share my screen. And while I'm doing so, just let me shortly introduce what I've been asked to talk about, that is social defense or civilian-based defense. Uh, and so we're moving a little bit away from Ukraine now because I'm going to present this concept as a general concept, not as a necessarily an alternative for Ukraine. At least in our context here in Germany, where we're discussing it and we're developing this concept at the moment as an alternative for Germany. Although, of course, the war in Ukraine was one of the major impetus to, to return to this concept. Uh, it's not what I'm going to talk about. It's not social defense in Ukraine, but this concept of civilian-based defense is an alternative for actually any country. So let me uh, shortly say uh, what, what, is, what is it? Uh, what do I mean by social defense or civilian-based defense? Uh, it's just generally saying it's a special kind of civil resistance of the much larger field of civil resistance. And it just has been developed as a, an alternative of non, for a nonviolent alternative uh, for defense in two cases, uh, occupations, so military attacks, and coup d'etats, uh, so internally uh, dictators who try to uh, gain power in their own country. The basic idea of social defense or civilian-based defense is that people are the most important source of power generally. I mean, it's not the only source, but it's without people, dictators cannot rule, occupiers cannot rule a country, uh, nor can any government do much with it if it doesn't have this cooperation. Uh, this idea is a very old one. Has, it has been developed already in the 16th century by Etienne de Labordier, uh, but, and it has been taken up by Jean Sharp, a name who's probably familiar to most of you as one of the uh, great uh, scientists, uh, researchers on nonviolent action. Uh, he says uh, that the, the basic idea is that of social defense is that the cooperation is refused. So not the borders are being defended uh, in case of an attack, but the freedom and the self-determination of people. And of course, the second basic idea is that nonviolence can be more powerful than violence. Uh, and uh, of course, it may fail as violence can fail, as war can fail, but resuming resistance later might be e more easy. Tactics and methods, and I think in Philip's presentation right now, we already heard many elements that are also elements or methods or tactics of civilian-based defense as it has been uh, developed uh, or proposed. Uh, it, one thing is uh, uh, symbolic activities like just keeping uh, or showing each other that you are part of a movement, that you are resisting. For example, in Ukraine, I understand now that yellow ribbons are used as the symbol and there have been in other struggles, many other symbols like that. Then there are strikes, non-cooperation, human blockades, like what uh, was mentioned at the beginning uh, by Eli about uh, human blockades in Saporizhnia, uh, and of course, international, uh, activating international support, dialogue with perpetrators, uh, and so on and so forth. The concept of civilian-based defense or social defense I would say has been developed in five stages. The first ideas were already there be between, or even before World War I, and then between the uh, First and Second World War. But the modern concept, as we have it in the literature and in the studies right now, was developed in, since the 1950s in the light of the threat of nuclear war. And there were both people from the military as well as peace researchers who said at that moment, well, defense. In the Third World War, it's not possible. We need an alternative because the Third World War would just mean destruction for everyone. So this was the main impetus uh, to develop uh, this concept. It was broadened in the 1980s. We looked at many more different scenarios than just military occupation or coup d'etat. Then I think we had a stage when people didn't really talk much about it. My own organization that was named Federation for Social Defense or for Civilian-Based Defense, 
we have been asked in the last 20 years quite often, don't you want to rename yourself? Who's working on civilian-based defense anymore? Uh, but now, the thing is, in the last years, especially since 2022, the interest really has uh, come back quite a lot. Uh, the older literature since the 90s, or developed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, has some classical cases that are very often quoted as examples, both for coup d'etats or international attacks. Uh, and it's not a bias from by myself being a German, but strangely enough, there are two examples from Germany, a coup that happened in 1920 and the resistance uh, in uh, against uh, an occupation uh, by France and Belgian troops to recover reparation payments in the rural area in, 20, in 1923. Then there are many examples of civil resistance in World War II, which might surprise some people because usually you think against uh, an enemy like the Nazis, uh, civil resistance is not possible at all, but there is a larger number and a growing number of cases we know about. Uh, there was a, especially a French uh, researcher, Jacques Samelin, who, who, who I can re recommend, who documented many of these cases. There were Algeria, there were Prague in 1968 when a uh, fledgling democracy movement was stopped by troops from the Warsaw Pact and people for maybe five or seven days resisted quite successfully against that, uh, that occupation. They stopped the tanks, you can see the picture here on the right, where they surround the tanks. Uh, they did not shoot, so it's nothing like uh, what we have in Ukraine now, but uh, they were actually quite helpless, And but then the leadership was uh, yeah, abducted or were taken to Moscow and made uh, to sign a agreement which then ended uh, that case. Uh, I said this is a, was the classical time of the classical studies. We now have a much larger uh, so rich sources about civil resistance in general. Most of these studies that have been produced in the last 20 years do not use the term civilian-based defense. They speak about nonviolent resistance, civil resistance, nonviolent revolutions, uh, or whatever the terms are, but much of uh, what they studied is, on the one hand, very useful also if we want to see what would work for social defense. And there are also some cases like in this book, Opting Out of War by Mary B. Anderson and George Marshall Wallace, that I would say are directly cases of civilian-based defense in cases of civil war. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I said, they don't use the term, but I think we can learn a lot for civil defense. There are several organizations, as well as researchers, who are working on it. Um, and I think the main challenge that we have at the moment is to, uh, to look at modern scenarios uh, with modern weapons, the whole issue of uh, electronic communication and so on, which was not considered in the old times that necessary to look at and uh, to see how this could be done. And here in uh, Germany, I mentioned that we just started a small campaign. It's difficult to translate to English. Uh, I chose the uh, the translation well fortified without weapons, which does not really catch the uh, mean the catch the meaning of the campaign exactly. This is a campaign where we want to develop social defense or civilian based defense at the local level. So I see there that this matches quite well with what Philip uh, mentioned in his resume uh, 10 minutes ago. Uh, so we tried to see how in some regions here in Germany, what it would mean if we chose civilian based defense and developed it. Uh, of course, there are also mixed concepts, um, and I'll not go into details here, uh, but there are uh, concepts how to combine civilian based defense with military defense. And my conclusion simply is that I think that military defense can get stronger in the sense of a total defense if, if civilian means are added. On the other hand, if you want to avoid destruction, if you want to avoid nuclear war, like the scenario about which civilian-based defense was developed, then military means become problematic. 
So we have a lot of questions and challenges, and for that um, I will end. Um, we need to ask how to counter the current politics uh, that are only that are based on the strength of arms and deterrence. How can we con overcome the conviction that only violence helps? What we hear everywhere. Uh, does civilian-based defense have a deterrent value? Something we need to discuss. How to update uh, civilian-based defense? I've mentioned that before. How to link it to conflict transformation, to dialogue? Uh, I think it's a very important question. And uh, also, we need to see how we can develop civilian-based defense without uh, getting uh, involved in right-wing right thinking and stereotypes that are sometimes also talking about how can we prepare against war, like Trevor Seen, uh, that I think you have in the US as well as uh, we have here in Europe. So there are also uh, traps and things we need to look at. And uh, the last question, can we expect countries to introduce civilian-based defense? So it's the only preparation that we could take nowadays. I mean, in countries that are still in peace or what's called peace here, uh, like uh, uh, civil resistance in the challenges that we face nowadays. Maybe that's, I think, the best preparation we can have. Thank you. That's, I hope I managed in the more or less in the 10 minutes I was given. Thank you. You did. Thank you, Christine. Thank you all. Uh, a very interesting series of presentations and we would invite your questions or comments, uh, your ideas in response to any of the presentations. And um, just as people are, are thinking about your question, just a couple sentences about the Czechoslovakia case in 1968. This is a pretty profound case where the Soviets had invaded because they were upset with the, the present government. And the military and the, the president decided not to resist militarily, right? So the civilians kind of spontaneously said, you know, we're not going to just kind of sit back and let this happen. So they did a number of really creative things. You had strikes, you had refusing supplies to invading troops, cutting airport services, blocking trains, switching radio signals, removing house numbers to protect leaders, undermining troop loyalty through fraternizing with the soldiers. And this became a really critical process for that community to build this resilience and network that eventually led to their uh, liberation in the 1980s. So uh, they were able to get some political concessions kind of in the shorter term, but it really led to that kind of democratization process that Philippe, I think, was pointing to earlier. So floor is open for your comments or questions. Yes. I think there's a microphone coming. Thank you. So how might civilian-based defense be limited by sort of population distribution and um, geographical features of a country? For example, Switzerland versus the United States. Would one of you like to answer that? Christine, perhaps? How would civilian-based defense be limited by the geography of a country, for example, Switzerland, compared to the United States and to the distribution of, of the population? I can't think so much how this might really affect it in terms of concert. I think it's more about the aims of the, of the occupier if we talk now about international aggression. Uh, I think uh, civilian-based defense would work well, if the aim is to establish a new political system, if it's just about natural resources or about using the land as the, what was the aim of the Nazis in the Second World War, just to have land for their own population, then it gets much more difficult. Although I mentioned that in World War II, there was still civil resistance and successful civil resistance. But I mean, in terms of life, population distribution. Maybe Philip has an idea, but I don't really have one at the moment how this might affect it. Thank you, Christine. Philip? Philip? Well, I don't have a specific, uh, you know, concrete answer regarding geographical 
uh, perspective. The only thing that uh, I was mentioning before is that, uh, of course, like uh, <clears throat> large countries require also, you know, uh, more our forces. And at the same time, you will face with different, uh, with more uh, municipalities, with more local communities. And this component of, you know, decentralization, for my opinion, is another value when it comes about the uh, uh, civilian civilian defense, because it creates different type of focuses, you know, uh, areas that you need to control. But if, this com this, if these areas are, are resisting, this will create some kind of, you know, uh, you know, difficulties, you know, or undermine the, the military goals of the, of the specific army. Thank you. Another question or comment? I would be very interested to know from any of you um, what, if you could say a little more about what kind of training and preparation and organization is needed in order to enable uh, civil resistance or civilian based defense to be effective? Christine, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, this is a much debated question. Uh, if we look at the cases of so, uh, civil resistance, and I mentioned that there are now there's a huge volume of experiences, you see that most people did it quite spontaneously, and but still planned. I mean, this is, for example, one of the things that very clearly come out in the study that I mentioned, opting out of war about uh, civilian-based defense and civil. Uh, war scenarios. They sat together and, and planned what they did, but they didn't do a non-violence training, as we might do when we plan to occupy a nuclear power plant or uh, a coal mining uh, area or something like that. Still, of course, it would be good and useful to have preparation, but uh, I think it's uh, yeah, it's. Uh, maybe not that important to have this kind of uh, trainings as people usually think. But that's, yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, Philippe, do, do you have a sense? I'm sorry, Tatiana, yes, please go ahead. Oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, I would be more critical as soon as I was taking part in some nonviolent actions and I was observing I was under occupation too. And I would think that uh, you do not, do not require special training, sorry. So you need a portion of realism and understanding of uh, context analysis. Sometimes it's important and it's possible to do. Sometimes it's too dangerous. So it should be more about realism and understanding of what's going on and different factors of influence. And is it possible to get nonviolent resistance at all? Or it's better to keep those networks of uh, cooperation, which can be more useful in a long term perspective, like, for example, those volunteers who are still acting in occupied territories and helping others to evacuate to help people and to save them, but they are not making it publicly. So that's more about uh, self recognition and uh, understanding the context which helps you to save not only your life, but other lives too, and to understand how it's possible to move on and how it's possible also to get supporters and support the network. Of course, we've gotten examples of individual protests in Russia, for example, and it was really uh, powerful in public, but still we need to think in a perspective of impact and how it's possible to add more uh, forces to get the result of it. Thank you, Christine. Philip. Yes. No, I will, it's a very interesting question because um, I, I would say that there are some basics you know, uh, regarding the uh, civil resistance and uh, the areas of non-violent discipline, uh, non-violent strategy, strategy planning, also understanding the opponent, understanding the, the pillars of the power of the opponent, and to have also some kind of you know, understanding of the, the, the military capacity of the opponent. Uh, for example, in, the, in Ukraine, uh, it was the, the partisans were were very effective, you know, organizing uh, sabotage uh, actions to the military uh, convoys and, and tanks, no, because they knew, you know, the, this type of, you know, uh, military, you know, architecture. Uh, but apart from that, I think that the, we there is an, uh, an area that we need also to, to explore is that how we can adapt civil resistance and civilian 
uh, defense systems to the new forms of war, like uh, we are talking about proxy wars and hybrid wars. So if we take a look on this type of wars that are really focusing on affecting the society, affecting the, the resilience of the society, affecting the critical infrastructures, affecting uh, the uh, polarizing societies. So here non-violence have a very important uh, role because if we can see, for example, at the end of the of the year, how the Ukrainian society was organizing, you know, to provide the, uh, you know, heater, you know, uh, shelter, you know, in the in these difficult situations where Russia were bombing the central stations, the energy central stations. So we can see that non-violence respond to, to to that. At the same time, polarization is very important. Russian is also um, uh, tensionating and attacking the cleavages in the in the Russian society, so in the Ukrainian society as well. So here, mediators, Novayan activists has a, a very important role to solve these uh, local conflicts, to solve this uh, this um, or to con con uh, to counter fake, fake news and counter misinformation. So, for example, now we are discussing with the uh, youth centers in Ukraine how to develop. Um, a program of countering disinformation and, and fake news in the in different parts of, of the country. So I would say that this can be, you know, part of civil resistance in a way because we are confronting this type of specific proxy works strategies. Thank you, Philippe. Thank, thank you all. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Um, oh, that's an echo. Uh, Corey Walsh from Humanity United. I just had a question for uh, Philippe. You spoke about social cohesion vis-a-vis um, -vis the consolidation of Ukrainian identity. And I was curious in theory or in practice how this is done while avoiding hyper-nationalism, exclusionary identities, in-group, out-group dynamics, and other things that in themselves become drivers of conflict. So as building social cohesion, how do you sort of think about mitigating those risks? Thank you for the question. Um, well, something that they, for me was uh, that they, is, is called my attention when I started to, to work in Ukraine was the, the, um, the great uh, community of mediation and dialogue uh, that is, uh, is established in the country. We have, there are more than 3,000 professionals working uh, on, on, on basically on mediation, facilitation of dialogue at different levels. And, and this network is, is uh, well, is, of course, is, is working in, in this concrete context. And with them, we have been uh, discussing this topic. I mean, they, there are uh, concrete, uh, of course, tensions in the society about the, um, uh, about the basically the, um, uh, the, the religion, of course, and, and they were also in the last months, there were some uh, discussions about, uh, um, you know, the, the role of the of the of the Russian, uh, you know, charts in, in Ukraine. There were also rumors that they, they were in, they found some uh, weapons in the in the basis of some charges, or there were also some cases where the the some priests attacked, uh, you know, people because they they because some, you know, some uh, you know arguments and discussions. Um, I think that the, the, what is happening now in the society is that people is realizing that the identity language is important for their uh, self-emancipation, for, uh, for the, the final liberation, so that they really they need to consolidate this, this identity. This doesn't mean that the, the kind of identity is only uh, unnational. Uh, I told you before that the, I mentioned before that there are uh, uh, different uh, ethnic minorities that there are also um, 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 recognized, you know, uh, according according to law in Ukraine, and, and they are part of the resistance. And you can see in the uh, in the demonstrations that we we recorded, we systematized, we we saw the the Ukrainian flag, but also the Tatar Crimeans. We saw that there are so a very uh, you know uh, uh, specific actions of support. From uh, you know human rights organizations supporting uh, Tatar Crimeans inside the uh, uh, mass in, uh, uh, Tatar Crimeans inside the uh, yeah in the peninsula, so so this specific support is happening. But uh, but yes, it's true that the the the, the process uh, is ongoing. It's, it's not that something is already completed, and there are already the discussions. I have, for example, uh, uh, cases where 
uh, families that they were uh, all their life they, they they went to the to Russian Russian churches to to pray that due to the to the situation and and to the uh, to this, the basically to the to the um, uh, to the basically the scandals of the Russian church in, in Ukraine, they start to to move uh, you know to the uh, to the Ukrainian church. It was difficult, but it was also some internal uh, intra-family discussions and processes that they they were they allow this process. So um, I think that they, again it's an ongoing process. Um, I think that they, what is very clear is that the, that the Ukrainian the, the consolidation of the Ukrainian identity which is of course connected with uh, with religion is is a, is a very very important topic now today in Ukraine and in many many of the areas of the country there are dialogue uh, sessions discussions at the, at the level of communities at the level of families at the level of, of uh, local government discussing you know how to deal with this issue so i will say that this is uh, an ongoing process and maybe my colleague tatiana want to to add something from um, from your experience Thank you very much. Thank you for the question and thank you, Philippe. I would just invite you all to uh, take a moment as we are coming to the toward the end of our time together to imagine in your own context, in the context where you live or the context where you're working or focusing, what would be a sequence of steps that might begin to move or to create a nonviolent civilian based defense approach? in your context? Does it seem possible? Does it seem impossible? How would you go about doing it? Maybe while you're thinking about that, I would just invite each of our panelists to say a last word or two, something that you would like to add that you haven't had a chance to say yet. Could we start with Christine? Sure. Um, yeah, I think, it it's a long topic and I think it needs much further and much deeper discussion than we could have today. And uh, for me, it's just important uh, to say that what I presented as civilian-based defense was really in the context of our countries that are in peace. We are not only we are sometimes accused to uh, tell Ukraine that they should go back to civil-based defense. And that, that's not my purpose. I think civil-based defense might have been an alternative earlier, but uh, for now, what the context we are working in is really our country. And so exactly the question that you, Mary, asked, what could we do in our country? Thank you, Christine. Uh, Tatiana. Yeah, thanks. Maybe I will add that we've got actually the system of civil-based defense and even before, but I don't think that it's working in terms of a current war. And uh, what's important for me, as soon as we've got this experience, is it's a good time to learn some lessons for the future and to revise peace building approaches, which we've got, because we still get a lot of problems, which we've got in Balkans, in African countries, and other contexts, and we do not learn from that, not only in humanitarian aid, but also in civilian based defense, in media literacy, in all the spheres. So uh, I would be really happy if we can learn our lessons and to put them on a different sphere of peace building interventions in future. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana and Philip. Yeah. So I, I will. Yeah. I think that it, for me it will be very important if we can we can increase political recognition of nonviolent activists, uh, people that they have been, you know, uh, they still today they have been. Uh, uh, struggling um, against the invasion, against the, the consequence of this war, and, and without, for many, many months, without the uh, payments. So political recognition at least, and, and try to also to, to increase uh, disposable political and financial support for, no, for the grassroots organizations from different regions, areas that, there are, that were liberated a long time ago, like uh, Chernihiv and Sumi, uh, or, or the areas like uh, uh, Hudson that trying to attract the human capital again to 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 start, for example, the, to cultivate. You know, there are we we have cases of uh, farmers that are you know removing uh, mines with their own hands in the from from the from the agricultural sites. So I think that the, it's very important that the, for Ukraine and also for, for for Europe and also for other other regions to support nonviolent uh, activists and, and, and movements and and yeah and thank you I, I, I wish you a, a fruitful 
um, uh, event and the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe and Eli, the last word. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. This is, uh, you know, really difficult, but also really significant uh, themes and imagination that we're hoping to stir and cultivate. So, you know, we hope you'll get involved to support these efforts and nonviolent resistance and religious peace building and to work really strategically about how we can scale up investments, training, and infrastructure for nonviolent civilian-based defense. So feel welcome to be in touch and we hope we'll, we'll see you again. Peace be with you. Thank you all. Thank you and have a good meeting.